Good morning, my friends. Welcome to our Lord's Day service on this glorious autumn day. Yesterday was quite something with the weather, but today the sun is bright and the air is, shall we say, very crisp. So very glad to be with you in the providence of God. Uh, before we begin our worship, just want to share a number of announcements with you. Uh, first, to thank you and encourage you to continue to bring uh, your non-perishable food items and in uh, particular, uh, diapers for the women at the Mercy Learning Center where um, women are learning to read and gaining their GED um, and all kinds of activities. Uh, the emergency food pantry uh, for these gals and for their children, a huge uh, support for them and thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, as you know, for many, 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 many years we've been doing Thanksgiving baskets for families um, who are in the care of the Department of Children and Families uh, and not able do, to do that because of the COVID-19 health requirements. But we are providing uh, cards for either Stop and Shop or for ShopRite. So you can uh, simply put a check in the um, basket on the, uh, the plate this morning um, and in the memo put uh, Thanksgiving baskets for Covenant to Care and then we will get the food cards and then we'll get them to the families so that they can shop uh, and provide for their families. On Friday, December 3rd, our shortened version of the Three Kings Bazaar, our annual uh, Christmas festival, uh, will be held on the front lawn. Uh, here comes Elizabeth, who's helping to plan it with Joy Nazaro. Um, good timing. Cue the leader. Elizabeth is here. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. All the details are in your bulletin. There'll be a hymns, a carol sing, and all the rest of that. Baking goods. If you bake it, they'll take it. So, and then they'll sell it to all the folks. It coordinates, of course, with the tree lighting, which happens on the green at 7 p.m. So from 6 to 8, come on the front lawn and celebrate uh, the arrival of Advent in the anticipation of Christmas. I want to thank all of the individuals and families who have already made a commitment, financial commitment for 2022, uh, through our annual campaign, Rooted in Love. These 81 households have to date pledged $242,000, so we're well on our way to providing the financial resources that are necessary to empower and equip our ministry as a servant church. You'll hear more in a few moments about uh, the settlement, resettlement, the welcoming into our community of an extended family from Afghanistan um, but we're helping these folks, 11 and all, as they become settled into our community with mobile phones and with laptops. Details about how to get in touch with David McInnes, uh, from whom you'll hear in just a minute. Um, be in touch with David if you can help provide mobile phones or laptops. That would be greatly appreciated. Are there any other announcements? to make other than, yeah. So the reallocation of space within our uh, buildings, um, if you would like to share your thoughts on the reallocation of space and particularly uh, that of the Hobart Chapel, um, the council meeting would love to hear from you on uh, Tuesday the 23rd, that is a week from this coming Tuesday. Uh, we'll meet up here in the dining room or you can uh, join the meeting uh, on Zoom. Details of that are forthcoming but we council does want to be in dialogue and hear your thoughts about this reallocation of space. Then let me invite you uh, to take a few moments to settle your hearts and minds, um, to remember to breathe. This is one of the things I forget all the time. I forget to breathe. Do you ever do that? You take in a breath and then you hold it. You forget to exhale. So. The prelude is a good time to really practice inhaling and exhaling in a rhythmic way with Frank as he plays the prelude. And then as the uh, choir uh, calls us into a deeper connection uh, with God in the introit, freedom is coming.
freedom is coming. As an open and affirming congregation, we want to welcome each of you uh, to our worship, and I'd like to invite De Deacon David McInnes to offer our words of welcome. David? Good morning. We seek to extend the extravagant welcome of God to all people, all the time. Regardless of your race, class, ancestry, gender identity, marital status, ability, age, immigration status, or sexual orientation, you are always welcome at First Church. We affirm your inherent dignity as a child of God. God created you just as you are, and loves you just as you are. We do too. God does love you just as you are, so then let us stand in body or in spirit to rise for this morning's responsive call to worship, led by Ms. Alex Ackley, who is the director of Disciple Road. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, David. Thank you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You, Lord, are all I want. You are my choice. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I praise you, Lord, for being my guide. Even in the darkest night, your teachings fill my mind. I keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. I will always look to you as you stand beside me and protect me from fear. With all my heart, I will celebrate and safely rest. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Sitting at your right hand, I will always be joyful. Now that you have my feet on the path of life, I will reflect the radiance of your love, for I am on the right way. So then please be seated and meditate upon the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. Alex, why don't you sit here and I'll sit there and then go for the uh, children's message. Okay? I'll go get my stuff. Hmm? Okay, okay. okay.
sake. That promises of God, the soul that though all hell should endeavor to shake, God will never, no, never, no, never forsake. In that deep assurance and trust, then let us come to God in prayer. You are the firm foundation. It is to you we turn. It is to this quiet place that we have come away to be an assembly gathered by your Holy Spirit where you are host for Christ has promised to be with us where two or three are gathered. So we are not alone, but are held in company with you. And so our hearts and minds, our spirits and our bodies are made one in you and in this worship. Coming apart to this place of worship and time of deep reflection, help us to renew our connection with Jesus whom we follow, that we may truly give glory to your name by the lives that we lead. For we do so, praying in the words that Jesus gave us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Hello. I would like to invite all the children to come forward for our message this morning. Let's all gather over here. I'm going to grab my chair. Here we go. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? I have some pictures to share with you guys, and I know you all know what this is, right? This is a picture of our American flag. And I have pictures of veterans. veterans. We have pictures of soldiers. And I have one more. It's an older picture, but it's a picture of two soldiers at peace. Isn't that beautiful? Like soldiers shaking hands. Now, I know some of you were off on Thursday. Some of you were not. My kids were not. They were not happy. But do you know why you were off on Thursday? Yes, Holland. Because it was Veterans Day. And on Veterans Day, we remember those who fought for our freedom. They fought so we can be here gathered together today and not have to worry about, well, not really anything, right? Because we're safe. We live in a safe place. Now, we celebrate, we celebrated Veterans Day because it was the anniversary of when World War I ended. Is, you guys knew that? Oh my gosh, you guys are too smart. The two sides of the war stopped fighting and made peace with each other. Now, sometimes the only way to have peace is to fight. So there are so many brave men and women that put their lives ahead of, you know, for us. They go and they fight for us to keep us free. Yes? Okay, can you tell me a story during the disciple road? Let me finish this story, and then you can tell me a story over there, okay? Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Um, we fight to keep ourselves or other people safe. And then, after the war is over, we thank the soldiers for doing such a great job in bringing peace. The soldiers risk their lives to bring peace. Jesus talked about how important making peace is. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called 
children of God. Jesus said, almost, blessed are the peacemakers, the people who make peace. Our soldiers help make peace all over the world, and that's why we thank them on Veterans Day and every day. No good soldier wants to fight, but they do it to make peace. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the day when we won't have to have wars or armies or soldiers. We pray for the time when everyone will do what is right. But until that time, we thank you for the men and women who are brave enough to fight so they can make peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's go to Disciple Road so you can tell me your story. I think I want to hear that story. That story. <laughs> Maybe we can invite him back next Sunday. <laughs> so um, I first wanted to thank First Church, to thank all of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you've welcomed uh, Celeste and I in a way that we, frankly, have never experienced before. Uh, we feel more at home here, I think, than, and faster than we ever have at any other organization we've been part of. So, so thank you. Thank you all. Um, one of the things that attracted us here was the very strong social justice orientation. I know you all feel. There you go. Thank you. Gotcha. I know you all feel and, and, uh, and means, obviously, a great deal to Celeste and I. It matches our own. Um, our interest in uh, refugee resettlement dates back to the Syrian crisis six years ago. Uh, we went door to door to area churches and synagogues then, um, and obviously Connecticut resettlement agencies, and we were one of the first to partner with uh, with IRIS and what's now well known as community co-sponsorship. Um, our experience was that while fraught with some uncertainty, and we've shared some of that with you here, um, and, uh, and obviously challenges, um, our experience was that uh, what started as an opportunity to change the life of another unexpectedly changed our own. Uh, and we remain very close friends with that family today. I'll tell you more about them in just a second. Uh, we were similarly moved by the uh, forced evacuation of so many Afghans uh, just a couple of months ago and, uh, and moved to put the band back together again with some old and some new members, including yourselves. Uh, as David mentioned, we're the Interfaith Refugee Resettlement Committee, IRRC. Um, in addition to First Church, that includes uh, St. Luke's, Christ and Holy Trinity, uh, Temple Israel, the Conservative Synagogue, and 15 Muslim families that self-identify as the Muslim community all in Westport. Uh, and, in, uh, and in Norwalk, the, Alm the Almadni Center. Um, after a couple of months of recruiting and, and uh, planning, and you heard some of that here, uh, we welcomed six of 11 families last Tuesday. It's hard to believe it's only been five days. Uh, we expect the other five on this coming Tuesday, so in just a matter of days. Um, it includes uh, eight adults and three kids, aged eight, five, and, and, and one. They're part of a much larger extended family of 17 that left Afghanistan and uh, sadly left some behind. Uh, Celeste will share some of that with you. Uh, but we also found out they have distant relatives here in, uh, in Connecticut. Uh, I can't tell you how many. We've met a few. But what was really touching was that they haven't seen each other in the 30 years, the families that have been here. Uh, they haven't been back to Afghanistan to visit them. So this has been quite a, an emotional couple of days as well. Um, 
as you may recall, uh, David speaking several times, this was many more people than we had originally planned for. David, you were kind enough to remind us many times that, uh, that as a welcoming church, or a welcoming church is also a courageous church, and that, uh, that uh, uh, indeed, it, it, uh, from your own prior experience, it takes a village, and it does. Um, knowing mo no more than the names and ages of those that were coming, uh, we couldn't have imagined receiving a, a, a more sophisticated, educated, and yes, bilingual group of people. Um, uh, uh, almost all the, uh, all the adults have been involved as activists, as journalists, as educators, and as healthcare workers. Um, a pleasant reminder, I think, of this, this whole co-sponsor experience, that it's a little like a box of chocolates. You just don't know what you're going to get. Um, I, I guess I, I wanted to share a personal note before I turn it over to Celeste. So my first call eight weeks ago was to the father of the Syrian family that we were settled five years ago. Mohammed al-Masri is his name. Uh, he is now the imam of the Ahmadni Center, which, as I mentioned, is a coalition partner. Uh, just days before uh, the first half of the family arrived, uh, I received a photo from Mohammed of he and his wife receiving their U.S. citizenship in Hartford. Um, a, uh, it was another reminder, I think, of our ability as a, uh, as, a, as a larger community to connect the dots between what we did five years ago and what we're doing now, and in the, not just in the form of our members, old and new, of our volunteers, uh, but the Almadni, uh, excuse me, the Almasri family themselves. Five years ago, they were recipient of our support, and uh, and today they're now giving wholeheartedly of uh, of theirs. I think it demonstrates, uh, as uh, I know, David, you've said and preached here many times, that uh, uh, kindness begets kindness, compassion begets compassion, and. Together, I guess, by continuously paying it forward and by welcoming a stranger, we can enhance our community and, in fact, help repair the world. Um, if I can, I just wanted to shout out many of you that have already been active here, uh, and I'm sure many more will, will be contributing. Sorry, the banker in me forces me to lead with uh, Jackie and <laughs> Maria, our finance team, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but in addition to that, and, and, and many have had the chance to meet the family already, Vanessa and Vicky and their daughters, uh, Julie and her army of Fairfield students, thank you. Uh, Phil Dwyer is going to be leading our education team. They're meeting with the family this week to get started towards school registration. Thank you, Phil, in advance. I'm not sure if you're here, but thanks in advance. Um, it's hard to believe today's only day five. Uh, but already I think we feel part of their very large extended family. I hope they feel, uh, I hope they feel a, part of, a part of ours. Um, I, I wanted Celeste to share at least a few of, uh, and frankly there's hundreds already, of uh, heartwarming and frankly heartbreaking stories that have been shared with us. Um, why don't I turn it over to you? Okay. That's a tough act to follow. Okay, so I'm going to try to paint a little picture of what we've experienced in the last five days. Um, so imagine arriving here at the base um, in Fort Dix on August 30th, August 30th um, and then going every day to look at a list to see if you're on the list for transportation. Um, they found out the day before they came here that they were on a list, but only half their family was on the list. Um, so they boarded a bus from Fort Dix. They had to be up at 4 in the morning and ready to go at 5. They boarded the bus at 7, and they arrived here about 11.15. So it was a long journey for them. The precious moments was getting off the bus and not knowing um, who they were coming to. Um, I was there with Kashid from the Amani Center, um, who was there as an interpreter. The parents didn't need an interpreter. They spoke English. They were amazing. And we presented them with yellow roses, which were given to me by a friend as a gift of friendship. So we presented those to them um, we were in Bridgeport. Um, they, when we opened the doors, there was a warm meal on the table um, from the Imani Center, which was a traditional meal for them on the table. And Chrissy, who was in charge of the pre-arrival, had brought in wonderful donations. The house was complete. Um, and she asked why they came with so many bags from the base. And they said that they thought they weren't going to have blankets. Um, and they walked into a house that was completely furnished with bedding, 
on all the beds, um, flowers on the table. They just felt so welcome, and they just kept going around. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And they turned to Kashid and they said, does everyone get this? And he said, um, you're very lucky. <laughs> you're very lucky to be in this community. And the stories just went on. They welcomed us to the table. They had us sit, the, sit at their lunch table with them. The mothers ran to the kitchen to make me chai tea, which you will receive every time you go to visit them. Um, and there were many stories. One precious moment was when I was asked to go into one of the Tamana's room with her. And she shared with me that when she got to the base, she found out she was pregnant. Um, and her husband is still in Af Afghanistan. Um, so she's here with her family, but not with her spouse. And she shared what she brought in her suitcase, and her duffel bag was about a little bit larger than this. Um, and she said, I want to show you what I brought. And she brought her wedding dress. And she proceeded to pull out her wedding dress, and her headdress, um, and explain to me that it's um, in Afghanistan, it's kind of like an Indian wedding. It's like three or four days. Um, and there's multiple dresses. And she said, I wanted to make sure I just brought two of my four dresses. So one I wore on the plane underneath my garments because they took my bags away. I could only bring one bag. Um, and the other one she had in her bag. So there were just so many precious moments like that. I brought this because last week we were able to secure another home on the same street. Um, and she saw me running back and forth between the two houses. And she wanted to give me chai tea. So she found this thermos that someone donated and gave me the chai tea. <laughs> um, but there are wonderful moments. They are so appreciative. And they keep telling us, all the volunteers, that you are my family now. So I thank you. The uh, trouble with having people like John and Celeste talk before the sermon is, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> but we're going to give it a shot. So let us welcome the Word of God as we join in uh, the Gloria, glory to the Creator, the Christ, the Holy Spirit, three in one. Glory to the Creator. now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so it really is people and people, right? We hear about refugees and resettlement and all the ravages that come with um, modern life and particularly uh, modern warfare, and we come almost numb to the fact of that it's actual people. And when you meet the people coming off a bus and somebody runs to bring you chai tea and you feel the warmth that you realize that we are people if we pay attention, uh, we see and experience uh, this deep reality, which sounds trite, perhaps, um, a glib affirmation, but I think is anything but, because it is an awareness of our essential identity as children of God, joined one to the other, inextricably bound, uh, we're all descended from Lucy in the Great Rift Valley in Tanzania millennia ago. The genes in me and the genes in you and the genes of all the people of the world from our one ancestor, Lucy, and all the ways in which we have divided and desecrated our identity um, in the 
years since. So I think it's very apt that today we are thinking about this because the gospel lesson today from, the, from Mark um, has to do with paying attention, staying awake, taking heed, um, becoming aware, never allowing yourself to be overtaken uh, by the troubles at hand, but to see more deeply beneath the current passing circumstances of life to the abiding, unending presence of God, our fir how firm a foundation, this deep reality, almost that we have to find ourselves in the basement to remind how the rest of us stands, how we remain standing. So this is the 12th consecutive reading from the Gospel of Mark, moving through uh, the Gospel as Jesus journeys from Galilee uh, down the river valley and then up into Jerusalem, uh, where he will meet his crisis, provoke his crisis, resulting in his death, his crucifixion, his burial, resurrection, and ultimately um, his ascent into heaven. So we're almost at the end of the liturgical year. We mark time in the church from the beginning of Advent, the four weeks before Christmas, and then through Christmas, and Epiphany, the season of Epiphany and Lent, the Holy Week, the entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and into the season of Pentecost, the gift of the Spirit, and then through again, and two weeks from today, we arrive back at the beginning of a new year, the start of an Advent on the 28th of November. Next week will be the reign of Christ. But today, these final words from the experiences of Jesus in his last week of his life as he's teaching in the courts of the temple. You will hear uh, in this passage reference a question posed to Jesus about the stones of the temple. Now, the stones of the temple are not random. It's not a field stone wall like you see around New England where you take scattered remnants of a glacial deposit and arrange them as best you can. The temple that was rebuilt by Herod, one of the greatest uh, building uh, programs of the ancient world, actually, Herod was called the Great, uh, not because he was particularly wise um, or a uh, skilled military leader. He was called Herod the Great because he built a lot of stuff, big things. And the biggest glorious of all was the rebuilding of the Second Temple, sometimes called, because it was such a massive rebuild, sometimes called the Third Temple. I'm reminded of uh, driving around Fairfield um, in the last 10 years where you'll see, you know, a two-bedroom expanded cape that gets remodeled and it comes out the other end a 6,000 foot estate, right? Still the same house, still under the same zoning regulations because you didn't tear down the old house, but baby, it's a new house. The same way with Herod, okay? So Herod's temple was composed of stones, limestone, that were 35 feet long, 35 feet long, 18 feet deep, and 12 feet tall. These are not field stones picked out of the dirt in New England. And so when the disciples say, Jesus, look at those stones, they're not saying, Jesus, look at those stones. They're saying, Jesus, look at those stones. Don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> oh, did you shut the camera off, David, during that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's in the ether. It'll never be gone. How can I scrub that? So as they came out of the temple where Jesus had been teaching, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones, what large buildings. And Jesus replied, do you see these great buildings? Now imagine this. These, these are rubes from the country. I mean, they've just fallen off the back of a turnip truck. They've never seen anything like this before. It's like taking a little child out of a rustic county, Maine, 
blindfolding them and dropping them in midtown Manhattan. Look at these large buildings. He says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Now they're thinking, now wait a minute. It's taken Herod 40 years to build this and it's all going to be gone. So they went across the Kidron Valley to sit on the Mount of Olives. Now, in the book of the prophet Zephaniah, it's foretold that the Messiah will come to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. The Kidron Valley lies to the east of Jerusalem. It's a very deep, it's a rift valley. It goes like it's just into, right into a V. So Jerusalem is on this side, the Mount of Olives is on the other, actually just a little bit higher. So when you're looking across, you're looking down onto the Temple Mount. And so they go there because Zephaniah has said, this is the place from which the Messiah will come. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked to speak with him privately. Tell us, when will this be, what you have said? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? And then Jesus replied to them, saying, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many people will come in my name, and they will say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This take place. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes and fires and floods in various places. There will be famines. But this is but the beginnings of the birth pangs of a new age. It's a commonplace literary device in ancient literature when times are desperate, when it seems as though all hope is lost, to fall into what's called apocalyptic literature. Apocalypse means the showing forth, as we've noted before. Apocalypse doesn't necessarily mean a conflagration, but pulling back the curtains, allowing us to see clearly. This is called Max Little Apocalypse. It's kind of a cute title, Max Little Apocalypse, right? You could get one for Christmas. I'm sure it's in a catalog somewhere. Okay. The showing forth of a better age. It's bad now, the literature says. It's terrible now, but the good times are coming. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Remain strong, steadfast. Don't let go. Hold on. The wrongs will be righted, and the wrongdoers will come to their end. And that's really what Jesus is saying. Take heed, pay attention, look at what's really happening. Don't allow yourself to become caught up in all the bad news. I have spent my entire life being a voracious reader of newspapers. I can barely bring myself to crack open the newspaper anymore. I do. It's a civic responsibility and a religious mandate. But boy, in all the ways in which our lives feel caught up in such... It, it really feels in many days like we've gone off the rails, doesn't it? And Jesus is saying, because he lived in a time just like this. Every generation thinks it's never been worse, right? Read what Socrates wrote about the generation that was coming up after him. He thought civilization was come to an end within a generation in the fourth century before the birth of Jesus. So, you know, these predictions of the end, as in destruction, I never really come to pass. 
These are days in which we are called upon by Jesus to take heed, that is to say, to pay attention to the real facts, not the passing facts, the circumstances, the temporary problems that beset us, but to go more deeply, to find ourselves standing on that firm foundation, that solid ground. For we are built not on shifting sand, but on the bedrock, which is God. This is one of the great things about what we do here. It's not for us to repair the world in toto. We can never complete the work. But neither are we free to desist from it. Tikkun olam, to repair the world, to recognize what is broken, and to fix that which we can fix. That's what we're doing day by day as a body of believers and individuals in our daily life, as a light to the nations, a beacon of hope, to take heed that God is with us, will not forsake us, will see us through whatever troubles it is that besets and befalls us in this particular way, day, and carry us and direct us and carry us on in creating with God a different kind of future. I believe, for instance, that helping to resettle refugees from Afghanistan is not only the work of God, and as it surely is, I believe, as John has pointed out, it is also the work of the nation. In a very real way, the mess that is Afghanistan today is a product of our intervention. And people whose lives are endangered in Afghanistan today are endangered because of their association with us. We have a moral responsibility as a people, as a nation, to do everything we can to save them from a fate which we have borne a great deal of responsibility. So let us take heed, not give up, don't lose hope, hold on. Look, look, for Advent is coming. Christ will be born again in the Bethlehem of our spirits, the Messiah. Let us welcome him with a world that is fit to receive him. Amen.
Take heed, for my heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn, wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Take heed. I want to thank Colleen Phyllis for being with us, and our wonderful chancel choir, and our wonderful director of music, Frank Martinetti, who's so cute on his little scooter over here. <laughs> that was a wonderful anthem. I'm afraid the uh, choir wants to be paid by the note. Or we're in trouble. That was a lot of notes, a lot of words, syllables. Wow. We should do more contractions of verbs at a lower the uh, cost, I think so. Thank you. That was really wonderful. My heart shall sing of the day you bring. Let the fires of your justice burn. This is what Jesus was talking about. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near. These are the birth pangs. We are living in the birth pangs for the world is about to turn. In our joys and concerns this morning, I would like to ask your prayers um, for our student pastor, Heidi Butler, um, who is with her father, uh, the Reverend Kevin Butler, who is uh, in hospice care um, for prostate cancer, and Heidi is with him and all their family um, in these days. And for Vanessa, my colleague, co-pastor, Reverend Vanessa Payne Rose, who's in Wellesley, Massachusetts, for the baptism of her nephew. I want to remember uh, the family of Bill Verdeer. Dear Bill, beloved member, stalwart, congregant here, one of the saints of our church, uh, hold his uh, son Billy and his daughters Susan and Kathy in our prayers. Wonderful memorial service for Bill uh, this past Friday, who died in the 99th year of his life, just four months short of 100. And these flowers are from the uh, bouquet. Kathy and, and Billy, thank you for being here this morning. And as Alex rightly did to celebrate the veterans, all those who serve, a remarkably small percentage of Americans now serve in national service and we do honor them in, in what they have done for our nation and pray earnestly for peace. On Friday this coming week, Connie Sargent will have surgery, so ask your uh, prayers uh, for Connie and um, ask your prayers for Jerry and Ellen Karoglian. Uh, Jerry uh, is in hospice care now at home uh, following his 14-year uh, struggle with pancreatic cancer. I've never known a person with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer to live for 14 years. Remarkable. Uh, but now he has come uh, to the last days of his life. He is at home receiving hospice care, help 24 hours a day, but it's a tremendous uh, load for Ellen, as I'm sure you know. So please remember them both. And Ellen, um, do ask you not to visit at this point. Uh, you can call and leave a message on Ellen's uh, voicemail on her cell phone. But uh, what they need is uh, quiet and peace. They are uh, surrounded. They know. I uh, tell them every time I go to see them how we are all praying for them and how much we love them. But uh, like Bill Verdeer, a singular individual. They don't make them like Bill Verdeer and Jerry Karoglian anymore. So give great thanks and pray uh, for Jerry's uh, peaceful passing. I want to thank uh, Sarah Jewell and her family, the Macaulay family, um, for the donation they made to the Deacons Fund this week in lieu of flowers and in loving memory of Catherine Macaulay, her daughter Kathy, and also in fond remembrance of Lizzie Polier and Louise Hull, Henry, and Nelda's uh, daughter, Louise. These three young gals in high school uh, were traveling to Silver Lake Conference Center um, in Sharon, Connecticut, is part of our youth fellowship and were killed in a very uh, horrific automobile accident in 1973. But they are still remembered and known and their memory is honored uh, by Sarah's wonderful gift. Uh, 
Are there other joys or concerns that you'd like to share this morning in our, in our time of prayer? Linda. Good. I'm so glad you want to be part of our congregation. Yeah. Yes. And you will be a welcome member of our congregation as well. We're very glad that you are here. Sure. Yeah. Great. Did I already thank you, Colleen? Okay. Good. I don't know. And then finally, a, a request from Petrina Cash. Uh, prayers for her family. She's uh, visiting her family uh, in North uh, Carolina and the loss of her uncle, uh, Roy Hairston. When, Petrina, you are in our prayers and all of your family. Let us be God's people gathered in prayer. Built upon the firm foundation of your love and finding ourselves centered in the concern and the care and the abiding compassion of Jesus, we turn to you in prayer and pray for those who are ill, O Lord, for your peace which passes our human understanding, for that healing that exceeds simple physical cure, but is the spiritual healing of peace, the peace which only your presence can bring that peace which passes our human understanding. And we pray for those whose hearts are heavy with mourning, for those who mourn dear Bill, and for all those whose hearts are heavy, for David and for Laura Gindek and all their family as they mourn the death of David's father, John. Surround these families, we pray, and this congregation, and each of us, as we offer ourselves to you in love. Equip, empower, and commission this congregation to be your body at work in the world. The heralds of your peace, those who live in the light of your justice, who welcome in the advent of peace with the establishment of your sovereignty, the establishment of your justice. In Christ we pray, amen. God has called us into the church to accept the cost and the joy of discipleship, to be God's servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join in his passion and victory. In order to empower the ministry of our congregation and the United Church, of Christ, as well as the work of Christ's church around the world, let us make an offering that is fit to God's purpose to share God's love and serve the world one way in which we participate in the new life Christ brings.
God of all abundance and self-giving love, we dedicate these offerings, our lives and the life of this congregation to you. Surround and fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit that we may truly follow Christ, disciples serving your world. Amen. Let us be seated as we meditate upon steel away. We have come to steal away, to be with Jesus, to find in this quiet place and this sacred spot, this sanctuary of God's Spirit, that home for which we all so deeply yearn, to which God is calling us and all humanity, 
to be renewed, that we may stand in the light of that eternal peace. So, dear friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the abiding presence of God's Holy Spirit, that sweet communion of God's love, rest upon you, reside within you, and be radiant in your living this day and all your days. Amen. serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.